What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video and in today's video we're continuing on my series of reviews on the Land Before Time films. There are 14 of these movies in its entirety and today we're talking about the fifth installment in the franchise, The Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island. Directed this time around by Charles Grosvenor, this is the first time he's directing a film in this franchise. This one has returning cast of people like Rob Paulson and John Ingle, but has tons of new faces in the franchise, including people like Thomas Decker, Miriam Flynn, Kenneth Mars, Andy McAfee, Aria Noel Curzon, and many more. Before we get too far into this, I'd like to say a big thanks to you guys for clicking here on this video and watching another installment in this series of reviews. And I'd also like to say a big thanks to my guest, and that is my buddy Mike from Did You See That? If you guys are just now hopping on, maybe you're a new subscriber and you're like, they're covering the Land Before Time movies, let alone the fifth movie. Yeah, we're slowly making our way through all 14 the Land Before Time movies. And for anybody who hasn't been keeping up up to this point, the first one has definitely been our favorite one it's a film i'm heavily nostalgic for as it's a movie i saw tons of times as a kid and this entire series is a first time watch for my buddy mike from did you see that and at this point after the first couple of sequels i hadn't seen any of the other ones so at this point moving forward this is a new experience for the two of us i'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to my buddy mike in just a little bit but before we do that i want to get into the general premise of this movie which is pretty familiar to the previous films so the movie opens up and we're in the great valley once again with our characters littlefoot sarah ducky petrie spike that whole gang we got you know littlefoot's grandparents you got sarah's a-hole of a dad and you got the rest of the gang that you're familiar with from the previous films and similar to all of those films some sort of danger some sort of threat to their livelihood ends up arising and this time around it's a bunch of locusts that appear and end up eating all of the greenery all around the Great Valley, forcing the kids and their parents to find somewhere else to go and live, find somewhere else to try to eat food and try to, you know, find a whole new path for life. As you've seen with the other films, the parents spend most of their time bickering, trying to decide what to do, trying to figure out who's in charge, arguing majority of the time, and without even noticing, similar to the other films, the kids go under their noses and end up finding whatever's going to be the resolution of the film throughout the course of time this time around you got Littlefoot leading the gang once again to go and try to find a new place for them to live a new place with greenery a new place for them to have food the most notable thing about this film that was definitely probably my biggest positive of the film is that we're reintroduced to the character Chomper, a T-Rex from the second film who was introduced and was uh, a hatchling at the time, couldn't even speak, and this time around in this film can actually speak and spend some time with our main characters in some pretty cute moments of dialogue, and this film, similar to the other ones, leans heavily into a lot of ideas of prejudice and the idea of being close friends or family with those who you have completely different lifestyles with. With people who come from different walks of life and that's definitely probably one of my favorite things about the land before time series is that each film has touched on prejudice in some way utilizing the various different species of dinosaurs to kind of you know give off the same vibe that you would if you were having a conversation of race and the different discourse that we have in the real world surrounding that so it was nice to see Chomper once again. It's nice that he can talk this time around. I thought he was a really cute character in the second film. I was always hoping to see him once again. And it's nice to see him reappear here. And again, utilizing him, the T-Rex, the sharp tooth as they call them. And kind of utilizing the fear that the, the kids and the rest of their family have for these individuals as a way to tell a story about prejudice and you know different walks of life and the ability to still be close with somebody and love somebody uh, who may appear dangerous to you may have a lifestyle that is completely different from yours now that we've talked about the base premise i'll go ahead and throw it on over to mike from did you see that and then we'll get back to my thoughts on this movie Anthony E. Perez, my brother, thank you once again for having me back on to another installment in the Land Before Time series. It's been a little while, so I appreciate and apologise for the delay in getting you this video. But yeah, we're here today to talk about Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island. Which, yeah, this one is directed by Charles Grosner, and it has got a whole bunch of new voice cast actors as the last one we talked about, Land Before Time, kind of wrapped up those original voice actors. 
I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'm not going to go into the plot or cast or anything like that because I'm sure Perez has probably already talked about that. I was going to go into that. All I'll say with this movie is it's very similar to the other installment, guys. There's nothing really new here. Nothing that like really invents the wheel. And I thought, okay, well, because we're going with a brand new director and a brand new voice cast, maybe they're going to pull something out from under the rug and kind of just have like maybe like a sort of a revamp, mini revamp kind of thing and give us something different that we've not seen before. But I feel like this does tread very familiar territory. So, for example, the character of Sarah was starting to get a little bit of character development in the last four movies. But I'm um, not happy to say she's back to being a bitch. <laughs> yeah, didn't like her in this movie at all. Yeah, terrible, terrible character. And one that never seems to learn from any mistakes or get any like real growth. Or when she does start to get character growth, they're like... Nope, we're not going to give you the good version of this character. We're going to give you the version that you don't like of this character. And that is exactly what happens here. Uh, the main positive I can say here is I like the song here that is called Always There. I really like that the fact that Littlefoot references his mom who died in the first movie for the first time ever. So it's actually kind of nice to have that bit of acknowledgement and kind of throw back to that first original movie, which it probably should have just stopped that if I'm being completely honest with you. But yeah, this movie, you know, it has some moments where you get like little chuckles here and there. And I guess it's not so much focused on being like some kind of big main villain as like every land before time movie has so far but the plot is definitely retreaded here in terms of there's no food so the kind of the kids have got to go find somewhere else to get food because the adults are arguing we've seen that all before it's nothing new it's nothing fresh it's nothing original whatsoever the new voice cast eh, no, not too bad not as good as the original voice cast that we had they're doing okay kind of surface level you know good job i guess you know they're given what they're given you know material and script rights they've just got to say whatever's on the script you know these movies again guys it's hard to kind of critique in a way because they are definitely made for kids but i guess at the same time i can argue that because these movies yes they may also be for kids but that first movie even for adults and kids alike are so adored the original the land before time that these movies, you think, oh wow, 14 movies, okay, cool, let's see what kind of direction they go in, and okay, well, as an adult, are they still enjoyable, but they're not, you know, don't get me wrong, one day, if I ever have a kid, I would love to sit them down and maybe show them all these movies, because I think definitely for kids, they will find enjoyment here, but there's pretty much nine times out of ten, the music here is nothing original, it's Pretty much the scene that we've had before. Maybe one good song out of the bunch, but not one that I want to add to Spotify immediately and be like, right, that's on a playlist I have every day. I want to listen to this song. I've not had that experience with this series yet. And I don't know if I'll ever get that experience. But anyway, that was just my very quick short thoughts. I'm going to hand it back over to your host, Anthony Perez. So once again, man, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And yeah, we're already five installments into this series. Very interesting to see how the other installments are going to play out. But back over to you, brother, and your remaining thoughts on The Land Before Time 5, The Mysterious Island. A big thanks to Mike for joining me here once again for another collab review this time around, The Mysterious Island. Yeah, man, I feel very similar to you where it's kind of hard to kind of think about what I'm going to say about these movies as time has gone on. There's a lot of regurgitating similar themes, similar story beats, similar things around a somewhat new premise for each film. There's always some sort of danger to our main characters and their families. The kids end up finding some sort of path to redemption. And then you have uh, the parents bickering majority of the film. And this film is no different. I found myself more engaged and I think in some of the last sequels in comparison to this one, even though this one does have the benefit of having Chomper return and making him more of a character this time around, which did make me care. And as I was mentioning before, while I enjoyed Enjoy the elements that lean into the idea of prejudice and how there are some social themes that can be taken from this movie yeah there is just this element of kind of just a cookie cutter made for kids movie and I kind of agree with Mike in the sense that it's kind of difficult to fully criticize these films knowing that me as a 30 year old guy and Mike who's a little bit older than me you know these films weren't made for us today they were made for us back then when we were kids and I watched some of these films and the sequels to these films when I was a kid so that's why I kind of wanted to re-watch these films to see how they hold up to me today and if you've been following this channel for a while you know I'm a huge fan of animated films kid films and I often cover things here that I'm nostalgic for and that I loved growing up as a kid and a lot of times even if it's cheesy even if it's dated 
a lot of those things hold up for me. And in the case of the Land Before Time series, as much as I'm enjoying it, it is difficult to really think about what to even say about these movies at a certain point because they do begin to kind of blend together they do begin to start to feel very samey now i won't lie as a fan of that original film and even some of the subsequent sequels that came directly after it that i remember seeing many times as a kid i almost always have a little smile on my face revisiting these characters i do enjoy a little foot in the gang i do have a good time seeing them except for Sarah the Triceratops, who, similar to what Mike said, has just been a fucking bitch since the very beginning of this franchise. And in the first film, it makes sense. You know, it's she's an unlikable character. She's the one who's a bit of a hard ass. And you would hope that by the time there was redemption and friendship found by the end of the film, that she would slowly have gotten better. But in each film, she's just been a terrible character and a terrible friend to Littlefoot and the rest of the gang. There have been moments in some of the previous installments that made it feel like there was some sort of growth happening in her character. But she was really bad in this film where she was completely selfish, completely manipulative, and consistently pushing people away, saying the wrong thing, hurting people's feelings consistently. And she's just such an unlikable non-growing character that it's really difficult five movies in to really like this character at all whereas with spike and petrie and, and, and ducky and, and littlefoot you know they're all so cute they're all so likable and then having a character like chomper reappear he was so cute and so likable so it was nice spending time with those characters together but sarah just makes it hard all the time so i have to agree with mike that she's just such an unlikable character and they consistently make her that way which is just really hard to get into her character and i'm hoping i'm hoping that by the time we reach the 14th film in this in franchise that something in me like sarah to some degree that something about her character has had some growth as both Mike and I mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of new people playing the roles here. Majority of the cast was recast. There are a couple of people playing a couple of key roles from the previous films, but for the most part, most of the cast had changed out. And I will say for the most part, I think the cast here does a good job, uh, at least emulating the voices that other actors had played before them, especially when it comes to the kids, because it can be very easy when you're binging or at least watching these so close to one another to kind of think, oh wow, that voice sounds drastically different. But I think for the most part that all of these actors who had to come in and play these roles that had already been established in other films did a good job of at least sounding pretty much identical to the previous iterations of the character making it really easy to continue watching and not even think about the fact that the cast had been changed so i definitely want to praise the cast when it comes to that element of the film as for the animation you know it's it's classic 90s straight to video animation and i think in a world where we're just inundated with so much 3d animation there is a charm going back and watching these movies today there's a charm to the 2d animation of this era just because we don't see that too often is this top tier animation of the 90s when it comes to 2d animation no way this came out in 1997 and by, and by this point just alone what disney was doing and dreamworks were doing in the 90s in terms of 2d animation i mean this is completely left in the dust you know this is in no way shape or form top tier 2d animation at the time which is why it was probably crapped on a whole lot by a lot of people back when it was originally coming out why it was kind of viewed as a straight to video franchise whereas in a world today again like where we're just so inundated with so many 3d animated films and there's almost a hunger for 2d animation uh, it is nice to go back and revisit these pretty cheesy yet charming 2d animated films that are kind of fun to watch visually uh, so on that level i did enjoy the animation even if it's dated by today's standards and even if it's dated by the standards of the time it came out in one of the most notable things in this film is there's a part where uh, chomper's parents two t-rex end up fighting another sharp tooth i think it was just another t-rex of some sorts and they're scratching each other and there's a little blood it wasn't gruesome it wasn't over the top but i was wildly pleased to see that there was a little bit of violence added into these movies just to kind of give it a little bit of grit and i'm talking the most small minuscule amount of blood um but yeah i thought that was at least worth mentioning michael tavera gives us the score here in this film and i think for the most part the score is pretty solid throughout the course of the film i enjoyed how it sounded it takes from that original film what uh james horner had done in that original film as the all the other films have done you know reprise some things from those 
those previous films, as well as adding its own element that's very consistent with what we've seen with the rest of the franchise. Nothing outstanding, but enjoyable to listen to. Which leads me into my thoughts on the musical numbers in this, and uh, yeah, similar to all the other ones, most of the musical numbers aren't really anything amazing. They're cute, they're silly at times, some of them are cringe-worthy across this franchise. There was none in this one that necessarily blew me away, but there were a couple of moments in some of them that made me a little bit emotional, specifically like Mike mentioned before, where Littlefoot does speak about his mother, who passed away in the first film, and he hadn't really mentioned her all that much outside of small moments in passing, and I found myself more more connected to him when we were leaning more into the things that have affected where we are today in the franchise. I really hope moving forward that there's more things that tie these films together outside of these just one-off adventures. I'm not really holding my breath on that, but I'm just hoping that as we continue on with the franchise and as we get into more modern day filmmaking, as we get into the 2000s and stuff with these movies, that there is something to kind of grip onto a little bit more and some sort of streamlined narrative that starts to expand a lot more. And I think that that's why I enjoyed Chomper's return in this film was because He's the character that came from the other film, and all that happened in that other film informed what happened here, and I think that stuff like that is where I'm going to find myself the most connected with this franchise. Can I look past some cheesy elements for this being made for kids of its time? Absolutely. Can I recognize that certain things are not going to be for me about this franchise? Absolutely. Can I recognize some very dated and cheesy songs that are implemented in here that are even bad for the time? Yeah, but you know, I think for me, what will keep me most gripped about this franchise moving forward is going to be seeing some sort of continuity, characters returning, dialogue that attaches itself to something that happened before, and events really having consequences moving forward. I'm not expecting it, but it's at least a hope as we continue on with the rest of the franchise. So yeah, guys, that's going to be my thoughts on the fifth installment of the Land Before Time franchise, The Mysterious Island. Not great. It's not the worst thing I've ever watched. I think it's one of my least favorite sequels in this run so far. Probably maybe not my least favorite, but one of them. Um, you know, I found the animation to be, you know, enjoyable for what it is. Again, you know, I enjoyed the music. I enjoyed the cast sounding pretty similar to the original cast. And, you know, there's some fun, cute moments in this film. As somebody who grew up watching films in this time, I still love watching you know things that are considered kids films or family films so you know i'm not the kind of person who's like oh this is for kids i can't watch it i can't relate to it in any way shape or form i feel like a big kid in a lot of ways and i do have that nostalgic attachment to that original film and some of the other subsequent sequels so it's nice to see you know these films when i do throw them on but I just am struggling at a certain point to even think about what I'm going to say about these movies because they do feel so similar. And I'm worried that two, three, four videos from now that we're going to be saying very similar things, similar to the films themselves saying pretty similar things and doing pretty similar things. So I'll go ahead and stop wasting your time right now when it comes to this video and say a big thanks to you guys for watching and also invite you to go down to the description box and give some love to my buddy Mike of Did You See That? You can find the link to his channel down below. Hit that like button, comment your thoughts, subscribe for more videos go give Mike some love and we'll see you guys in the next installment for Land Before Time 6. Whoo! Bye-bye.